Hello and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Michael and on behalf of Whale Coast Conservation, a very warm welcome to all of you. Um, and now it gives me great pleasure to welcome Dr. Andrew Baxter uh, to join us this evening. Uh, Andrew has spent many, many years working on Cape Leopards. He helped found the Cape Leopard Trust. He's incredibly passionate about leopards and we are very honored to have him take the time to join us um, uh, this evening. I want to remind you that this talk is recorded so you can share it with family and friends who might miss this evening's conversation. And we do urge you to um, list as many questions as you might have at the end of our talk. We'll leave some time and I'll try and moderate any of your questions and you can do that in the Q&A um, button at the bottom of your screen or the chat button. But now I want to hand over to Andrew. Andrew, I hope you're well and thank you for taking the time to join us this evening um, and over to you. Michael, thank you very much for that warm welcome. Um, and it's, uh, it's uh, a great pleasure for me to be here tonight. And I, I was just checking the number of participants a little earlier and I see we've got quite an audience. So it's uh, especially gratifying and, uh, and welcome to you all. Uh, listeners and viewers. Um, I hope you have a, a, an enjoyable evening. I hope you've got a glass of chilled Sauvignon Blanc or whatever your preferred beverage is because it is indeed a, a beautiful spread and summer evening uh, in the Cape. So yeah, it gives me a, a great pleasure to talk to you tonight about uh, leopards of the Cape. And uh, they are indeed uh, a very special bunch of leopards and, and I hope to take you on a little bit of a journey into their world uh, tonight. And I know that many of you that are, are based out in the Overberg region and the Hermanus region are very passionate about wildlife and, and you're aware that there are leopards in the mountains uh, nearby. And so this should give you some, some useful in insights. Uh, and just by way of uh, a special thanks to the hosts, uh, Mike, thank you very much for facilitating this. And also especially thank you to uh, Dr. Nina Lee um, from Wild Coast Conservation for the opportunity to chat to you uh, this evening. Uh, and uh, I know that uh, uh, Anita published a, a very interesting piece on leopards in one of the local uh, uh, newspapers, uh, media, two days ago, reflecting on the plight of leopards, not only here in Western Cape, but globally. So it is a very topical issue. So uh, I'm going to take you on a, on a kind of a pictorial journey tonight into the world of, of the leopards of the Cape. Uh, and I'm going to draw this distinction about leopards of the Cape quite often in the conversation. And you'll get to see why we regard them as, as being particularly special. Indeed, a separate management uh, population uh, by comparison to leopards elsewhere in Southern Africa. Uh, there isn't enough time, unfortunately, to tell you about all the things that the Cape Leopard Trust does. There are three essential pillars. There's the research, uh, scientific research, which is key, obviously, to understanding these animals. Applied conservation uh, is the second leg, and then there's a, an extensive education and outreach program. Um, we're not going to have time to delve into everything, so I'm going to focus the talk really around leopards um, that occur in the Boulan region. We have a, a particular project called the Boulan Project, and it almost verges on uh, to the Hermanus area, but it, it, it's extensive in, in terms of uh, its geography from the Kuchelberg right up to um, the mountains near Tolbach, and, and we'll go through that and, and share some of the learnings that we've had from there and, and some from the Cedarburg uh, as well, further north. So just to reflect what Michael was saying, if you have any questions, please fire them through to Michael. I think you can type them in the chat box and, and I'll try and address them at the end. I, I do need uh, a little disclaimer though, uh, and that is that I, I'm not the guy that does the research. <laughs> There's much cleverer people than me at the Cape Leopard Trust who are, are much better equipped and uh, uh, to do this kind of work and have done over the last 15 years. I, I'm a trustee of the Cape Leopard Trust and, and my passion for leopards is such that when Quinton Martins originally proposed this idea of getting to know these leopards um, in greater detail, it, it didn't take much to convince me that I needed to be part of this. But I have an oversight role as opposed to being you know, some boots on the ground. Uh, and I'd, I'd like to introduce you to some of those people during this, this presentation. So credit must really go to the team that, uh, that are behind this. Uh, on a personal note, I mean, I grew up in the Boerland, uh, not far from a little town called Wolseley, and as a 10-year-old boy, um, I uh, came across a, a leopard in a gin trap um, that had been there for several days, uh, caught um, 
uh, and by probably one of the farm workers and set this trap to to catch something to eat. Uh, caught a leopard, would be too terrified to tell anyone. And by the time uh, we'd called the SPCA, uh, there was no hope and the leopard had been put down. And it was quite a, a, a moving moment in, in my formative years. Uh, and it certainly um, has helped me to uh, foster a, a great appreciation of leopards ever since. And she's probably why I'm here talking to you about it tonight. So this, uh, this talk is about leopards in general. Um, and we're going to focus, obviously, on, on the Cape Leopard. Now, I need to get my screen to move to the next slide. And immediately, I'm being challenged to do so. Uh, so please bear with me as I try and work that out. Um, ah, there we go. Fantastic. Look at that. Got to, if, you know, if you're in doubt, just reboot. Uh, so, okay, well, look, leopards in general are, I mean, they are extremely versatile and adaptable animals. I mean, they occur in a wide variety of, uh, of habitats all around the world. You know, on the top left, you can see a, a forest habitat, a savanna habitat, habitat on the right. They're in deserts. We know that. And of course, the bottom right-hand corner is our own Cedarberg Mountains, very rocky and, uh, and inhospitable. Uh, so hugely adaptable. And of all the, the big predators, the most adaptable. Um, and their ranges are, are, are therefore extremely wide. Uh, and they um, are even known to, to move into sort of peri-urban areas. This was a fascinating study. I think it was reported in National Geographic um, by, um, I can't remember who the photographer is in this case, but uh, Steve Winter, that's right, uh, who captured this leopard in deep in the streets of Mumbai in India. Uh, and I think there's been several occurrences or reportings of leopards moving into urban areas around the Cape as well, including deep into a suburb in uh, in Port Elizabeth not so long ago. So they are opportunistic and versatile. They are enigmatic and elusive. And that's what makes them so interesting and, um, uh, yeah, and adaptable. So just uh, by way of an overview of leopards in general, I mean, there are nine subspecies of leopards around the world. Uh, and this map, this global map, indicates um, that distribution highly threatened in, in most habitats. Uh, and it is the African leopard of the, the, the Pantheria pardus pardus, the leopards of uh, our subject of our discussion tonight that are the most widespread remaining. And that's simply because their habitat is, is still intact. In other parts of the world, the habitat is, is under so much duress that there, there, there's very little habitat left for them. The uh, <coughs> word leopard, for example, um, which has recently been declared as a separate subspecies, making it the ninth. Um, there's less than 2% of its original habitat remains. We're lucky in, in Southern Africa that there are still tracts of habitat, but these are increasingly under threat. So looking more specifically than the situation in, in Southern Africa, I mean, this would represent the extent of the distribution. Uh, historically, uh, leopards would have occurred throughout Southern Africa, although probably less so in the, in the uh, Great Karoo Basin simply because the environment there is not necessarily conducive to them. But you can see in this map here that uh, certainly across vast swaths of Southern Africa, leopards occur. Uh, and then there's this absence currently in the middle, uh, largely because of uh, agricultural practices and, and uh, habitat disturbance. And then to the south of the country in the area that, that we're interested in, the Cape, uh, there are these, um, these isolated refugia, these protected mountain areas that, um, that provide a, a safe haven for, for these leopards. Uh, and, uh, and that's what uh, is so, so interesting, because it would also seem to us that these leopards have been separated uh, from each other for quite some time. And, and that's certainly reflected in a number of different uh, indicators, including size, morphology, genetics, etc. So if we just take a step back in time and we consider what the Western Cape would have looked like uh, three or four hundred years ago, certainly prior to uh, the colonial origins here, uh, the Cape was noted uh, for having many of the big five uh, in, in relative abundance. I mean, elephants were known to have occurred in the Half Bay area around Cape Town. Um, uh, hippo have uh, been, were reported all around the, the, the wet areas of the, of the Western Cape, the extinct now, extinct um, Cape Lion with its dark mane was reported widely, uh, Cape Buffalo. And there were other big predators and large animals. So of, of those animals, the only ones, the only significant large predator that remains is, of course, the Cape leopard. And the map on the right does indicate to you uh, the extent to which the uh, habitats have, have been overtaken by either urban development and urban sprawl or agriculture. So the last 
vestige of kind of wilderness really is it, uh, these mountain areas that run north to south, um, extending from the Huntam Mountains in the Northern Cape all the way down to the Kocherberg and then uh, in the north-south axis and then east uh, all the way through essentially to the Eastern Cape and, and Babi Arnsberg. And, and this corridor um, is fairly extensive and those, although not defined by a, a large game fence, are still uh, wild refugia and wilderness areas. And it's in these pockets, these mountainous areas, that the, that, that the leopards still remain and have a strong hold. So, you know, the question is, what, why, why are leopards important to study? What, uh, what is significant about them and why are they important to us? I mean, beyond the, the obvious physical attraction and the aesthetics and, and the fact that they're cats, uh, why is it important for us to, to study them and, and indeed conserve them? Uh, well, you know, at a fundamental level, there's a, there's a, we have a moral obligation, I think, to protect them. But uh, more than that, there's, a, there's an enormous ecological importance in what we refer to as protecting the trophic cascade. And because they're the apex predator in these mountains, they have a habit of, of keeping the rest of the, the ecosystem in check. In other words, the mesopredators that fall beneath them, the jackals and the caracals and others, would, would proliferate in the absence of leopards and would upset this ecological balance. Um, and so there, there's an there's a important sort of structural integrity of the ecosystem and the biodiversity maintained by having these apex predators in the system. Uh, equally, if one was to overlay um, an ecological and biodiversity and ecosystem services map of significance uh, over the Western Cape, you find that all the catchment areas, all the mountain areas would be uh, flashing red because they provide such important services um, in terms of water catchments and, and biodiversity in general. And, and that's exactly the habitats that these leopards occur in. So by definition, by protecting leopards and their habitats, we're also conserving all of the other uh, animals, plants, animals, and uh, what we refer to as, as ecosystem services, although I don't like that word at all, but it's the, the, the natural environment from which we depend in this case, particularly in the Western Cape water, would be, would be primary. So a couple of quick facts about leopards in general, and this applies to all leopards. Um, they are mainly nocturnal, which is why they're very seldom seen. 85% uh, of their activity is, uh, is nocturnal at night. Uh, they are by mostly solitary. In fact, the only time they really come together is, uh, is when they mate um, for short periods of time. Uh, the females, of course, will raise their cubs by themselves, um, but they will then be uh, dispersed uh, or pushed away at uh, around 18 months or so. And then those individuals will, will grow up alone in, in solitary. Uh, there are no, no family units and cute little families running around. So when one does see a picture of of more than one leopard, it's generally sub adult cubs that appear to be like a little family. Although we do have pictures of, of, of coupling pairs, males and females, in some of the camera tracks, but mostly they're, they're um, alone. Uh, the other interesting thing is that the rosette patterns, the, the dots and spots, uh, are much like a human's fingerprint. They're, they're unique to each animal, and um, we can use that um, uh, to determine. Um, identify them and track them through time, through space, using our camera trap surveys. And we've got a novel way of doing that, which I'll reflect on shortly. So, leopards of the Cape, um, you know, we, we've indicated that they, they have, they're an iconic umbrella species, that they're important for biodiversity in general, um, that their, their balanced populations are important in creating environmental stability for, for certain stability in the ecosystem. Uh, and that they're, um, uh, they, as we've demonstrated in places like the Cedarburg, have a, a huge value beyond just their presence, but also from an economic point of view, from a tourism benefit. So it's very unlikely that people go there and actually see them, just knowing that they're there um, brings economic benefit to, to that region. The Cape Leopard Trust uh, was founded in, in 2004. It's an NGO, a public benefit organization governed by a board of trustees and a very um, comprehensive um, a number of advisors, specialist advisors, smart people who can guide us in terms of the scientific research. And uh, this is just a picture reflecting some of our staff, a very dedicated team uh, of people. And um, they execute the work of, of the Cape Trust, the education project, the scientific research and the conservation work 
uh, in a number of project areas uh, around the Western Cape. We collaborate, of course, with a number of other organizations and stakeholders, including Cape Nature and, and many other NGOs in the conservation sector. So it's by no means just uh, the, the organization by itself. It, it works collaboratively uh, with many, many other organizations in order to deliver the outcomes that it has. Uh, and the objectives of, uh, of the Cape Leopard Trust, the purpose and vision, of course, is to ensure the long-term survival of leopards um, uh, and, and, of course, their habitats through rigorous scientific research, which is fundamental, um, and uh, the applied conservation initiatives, much of which you'll learn about as we go through this, this, this project. So where did it all begin? Uh, 2004, in fact, uh, a young, uh, enthusiastic young man called Quentin Martins um, dropped into my office and, and begged me to sponsor him a warm sleeping bag and some sturdy boots. And he told me that he had decided to make his life's work to study the leopards of the Western Cape. And I'd remembered that in the 1980s, a guy called Peter Norton had done some preliminary work on leopards, but nothing had happened ever since. Uh, and so I was quick to support Quinton's uh, efforts and make sure that he wasn't going to die of hypothermia. But I was, it, it piqued my curiosity, and, um, and shortly thereafter, we met up with many other passionate people um, behind Van der Westhausen, I believe might be on the report tonight, the chairman of the Cape Leopard Trust was one of those early adopters. You could see the passion in Quinton's eyes, and, um, and, and was happy to support him. And this is a picture of the man himself, and those are my kids many, many years ago, 16 years ago, 15 years ago, they're all grown up now. Uh, and uh, you know, I, I don't think I've ever met a man more passionately committed to um, to a conservation project than Quinton. And he really does need uh, to be acknowledged for the immense work he did in, in, in contributing to this this project over many years. Quinton has subsequently moved to the U.S. with his young family, but uh, visits from time to time. And we're very appreciative for all of his efforts. Um, so the, the current uh, and some of our previous projects, uh, Cape Leopard Trust projects, uh, spans the Northern Cape up in the Springbok. Uh, the FKM William and Citrus Doll is the Cedarburg project, which is an ongoing project. The Boerland project is the green one around Worcester, and there's been some work in the Little Karoo as well. Those have been our primary study areas. Now, many of you that might be based in Hermanus will be wondering why it doesn't quite extend to Walker Bay, and it doesn't. Uh, but it comes pretty close because it gets down to the sort of the extent of our survey area for which we have permits and approvals is uh, down to the sort of bottom of the estuary. And it's not hard to imagine that leopards may be able to cross that little barrier uh, into the mountains behind Hermanus. So in order to actually understand and get a grip on what's actually happening with these leopards, because remember that we've indicated that they're incredibly elusive, hardly ever seen, uh, it, it took Quinton, I think, two years before he actually physically saw a leopard in the wild uh, in the Cedarburg, despite the fact that there were many clues. Now, how do we gather this information about them? How is it possible to learn about them when they're so difficult to see, find, and study? And that's basically all one really ever gets to see in the mountains is, is, is evidence of leopards via their sport. So we know that they're there, but uh, that doesn't tell us a huge amount. So there are a number of techniques. I mean, obviously, they're just their presence where is one thing, but leopards have uh, particular behaviors. Uh, scratching trees is, uh, is one that tells us about them, and uh, they, they scent the trees in the process. They would have land between their, their pads, and they mark their territory in that way. Uh, leopard scats are found all over the mountains um, and, and are often positioned tactically by the leopards as uh, a means of marking their territory. Um, and contained in those scats is a wealth of information. And there's DNA information, there's the diet, of course, of the animal can be determined very easily by microscopic analysis of the, of the hairs, the bones, uh, and various materials in the scats. And, and that is part of our research because it tells us about the prey densities and well, the, the prey species, the preferred prey, prey species uh, of, of the leopards in different areas. Um, and then, of course, we're able to identify kill sites as well. So where leopards are predated, they leave behind remains and we're able to, to determine things from, from them that way. So although they're elusive and not um, sort of uh, entirely visible to us, they're leaving important signs from which we can learn a huge amount of information. But probably the most important tool in the leopard researchers arsenal are these rugged uh, infrared remote camera traps. Uh, many of you may be familiar with these, you may even have some yourself. Um, but they're an incredible tool, not just for, for leopards, but for actually determining what, uh, you know, what animals are occurring in the mountains anywhere. 
uh, and have been a huge contributor to our knowledge of, of biodiversity in general in the, in the mountains of the Western Cape. And, and I'll show you some pictures of that of really fascinating stuff. So these, uh, these machines can be left out for many months. Uh, they run on batteries, they're weatherproof, a proper high um, capacity SD card in them and position them in, in a very strategic manner and, uh, and go back and collect the cards every now and then. And of course, for every thousand images that are taken, only one might be of a leopard. So there's a huge amount of data to, to, to work through. But that data in itself is, is important. It tells us about what other animals are in the system. So, um, you know, we position them and we've learned over many, many years where to put these camera traps um, in order to get the best results. Uh, that's become obvious to us. Leopards follow the path of least resistance. They use slopes and cliffs and ravines uh, to navigate their way around, often using roads and tracks and paths as humans do. Uh, and so we were able to place them strategically. So in this picture, uh, there's a camera trap on either side of the, of the road, one on the left, one on the right. And the reason why we do that is we need to capture images of the animals uh, from both sides because that helps us with the identification process. We get a left-hand side image and a right-hand side image. And then we build up a, a, an image repository, a bank of leopard images from which we can then identify them going forward. We have some software that enable us to <coughs> analyze the rosette marking. So here are here is a picture of four leopards. And once we've done the analysis on them, we're able to determine that the leopard in the top left-hand corner and the one in the bottom right-hand corner are in fact the same individual based on a particular sequence of rosettes. And the same applies to the one on the bottom left and the top right. And it, it sort of shows you how, how we're able to identify them. And that's always helpful if you get a picture from both sides. It's equally helpful if we get a picture of the tail in the process because we can then quickly and easily identify whether the animal is a male or a female. It might seem obvious to you that the, sort of the heavier set individuals would be males, but we never make that assumption until we can absolutely categorically determine that it's a male or a female before assigning it its gender code, because sometimes we can get it wrong. So um, we like to apply the science rather rigorously. Um, and these camera traps not only tell us about um, uh, the, the, the sex of the animal, uh, their behavior, the mating behaviors you'll see, but also the, the way in which they move around the environment. So if you move the cameras around, and often these surveys that we have, we have hundreds and hundreds of these camera traps out in particular uh, environments over period, long periods of time, we're able to determine the extent to which the animals are moving around in the landscape. So here's uh, just another great picture of a male leopard. And we know it's male because you can see his testes. Uh, he's also a thicker set, uh, thicker head or neck area, quite robust. Um, another male, so it's uh, you're hunting from the cedar, but we try not to anthropomorphize them, but, uh, and they will get sort of long, elaborate codes. But uh, just amongst the research staff, we, we often give them nicknames because we, you know, it's easier to say Johan rather than M137C. Uh, and he was a, he was a substantial uh, chap, one of the earliest uh, recordings we had in the Cedar Bay. Uh, uh, very impressive. Cape Leopard. And there's a female, Oma Mikey, a little bit more slender. Um, and uh, in fact, there's quite a lot of sexual dimorphism that's significantly, the females are obviously significantly smaller than the males. Um, and we'll get onto that in a little bit more detail shortly. Pictures like this aren't always helpful because if we can't see the tail, we can't determine, determine the, um, the sex. But if I flick between these two images here, you can see this huge size difference between these two animals. And it's safe to assume that that one could be a female, although we wouldn't verify that until we really knew it could be a sub-adult male. But that one's definitely uh, likely to be a male. And if you just have a look at that front left-hand paw, the size of it, it is significant. So other behaviors of leopards and uh, information we can get from these camera traps is just the way in which leopards mark their territories. They are like, just like domestic cats, they like to have a big scratch. They find a tree and it's, you can be glad it's not your sofa at home because they, they, can, they can really, really um, make some impressive scratch marks down some very hard and big trees. If you see the guy on the right, he's really having a big scratch. If they do so, uh, not only to sharpen their claws, but also to scent um, their territory. They've got glands between their claws and, and that leaves a scent behind. Uh, they also mark their territory by spraying. So the male on the left is having a little tail up spray, urine spray on the tree. And at some other stage, um, what appears to be a, 
uh, a female is coming up and she's investigating the scent. I cannot tell you what the outcome of that was. One can only assume. But in this instance, we do know what the outcome was uh, because this is one of those rare occasions when you see a male and female leopard in one camera trap picture. Um, we subsequently were able to confirm that Johan, who had a, a significant uh, territory um, in the Cedarburg, very, very vast area that he uh, dominated, um, had at least three females uh, inside of its territory and would have been mating with them uh, when the opportunity arose. And in this case, they come together and mate, during which time the male is quite protective of the female because while he's covering her, he's uh, quite uh, keen to ensure that no other male is getting to her. So he does hover around and, uh, until effectively the job is done. And then he's like many males, uh, just uh, flits off into, into the wilderness. Um, all right, so uh, you know, what does this vast amount of data we collect from these, uh, these camera traps really tell us? Uh, you can imagine that if we're collecting thousands of images from every single camera trap, uh, it's a huge amount of information. So we, we digitize it all, we collect all the images, we're able to determine uh, identification or identikits for the leopards, they're date stamped, um, and we also collect the, the information on all the other animals that we collect because that's useful for understanding what's in the environment and the prey densities. And um, we then run some fairly sophisticated statistics on this in order to determine uh, home ranges, how these animals are moving, the frequency at which they move, uh, etc. So it's a, it's a very useful non-invasive tool for us to learn a huge amount, not only about leopard ecology, but about the ecology in the mountains in general. There are other ways, of course, of studying leopards, and they give us different types of information. So um, if one is able to collar a, a leopard and, and attach a GPS collar, a little bit more complicated because this does, does become uh, an invasive process. So it's something that we, we don't do very often, and we only do uh, once we've got all the necessary approvals, uh, scientific approvals, because obviously there would need to be a, a very important uh, scientific outcome from such a study. Um, then, then we would attach a collar to uh, an individual with the purpose of, of really trying to understand uh, a particular problem. And in this case, uh, it gives you much more accurate dense uh, information around how the animal is moving, home ranges, uh, how it integrates with other leopards in the area, and how it is predating. So, um, yeah, so we haven't done much collaring for, for many years because we prefer to use the camera traps, um, but there is information that we have on, uh, on leopards accumulated through the GPS collaring process. So what have we learned uh, from all of this? A couple of things that distinguish the leopards of the Cape from uh, other leopards, or what we refer to as the savannah leopards, is the, the leopards here are far smaller than leopards that occur elsewhere in, uh, in the subcontinent. You know, typically, the average size of, of a male leopard uh, in Pinda or up in the Kruger or the Kalahari would be 60 kilograms and above. I mean, they can get up to 80 or 90 kilograms even. And they're substantial uh, and potentially dangerous animals. Uh, in the Western Cape, the average size of a male leopard is, is 30 or 35 kilograms, much, much smaller, uh, approximately half the size. Similarly, for the females as well, the females can uh, average around 20 kilograms in the Western Cape, which is about the size of a male caracal. So just to put it in perspective, uh, and, and, or a small dog. And as a consequence, they're not particularly threatening to people. Uh, and there's been no recorded instance uh, of a, a leopard attacking anyone in this uh, you know, in an unprovoked situation. So um, yeah, it, um, it, it does highlight quite an important morphological distinction. And the question is, why are the leopards in the Western Cape therefore so much smaller than leopards that occur elsewhere? Um, we're a couple of other things we've learned is that uh, they're smaller because they have, to, they have to cover huge home ranges in order to satisfy their dietary requirement. The prey densities are much, much lower in the Thainbos biome than they are in the savannah biome. They're typically a large male in uh, a pindo or in the bushveld has probably got a home range of 20 to 40 square kilometers. And in the Western Cape Mountains, that can range up to hundreds of square kilometers. In Cedarburg, in particular, many hundreds of square kilometers. So these leopards are ranging vast distances. It suits their, them to be smaller and more compact to cover those distances. Um, they also don't have the advantage of ambushing prey from trees. 
Um, and the prey, of course, uh, in the Western Cape uh, is generally much smaller. There's a small antelope in the mountains or gussies or porcupines, um, as opposed to impala, which is typically what uh, savannah leopards are, are hunting. So morphologically, the, the leopards have adapted to fit into the, 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 the different ecological constraints uh, imposed by the famous biome. So that's uh, a very interesting insight. Um, and this, the, the home ranges, of course, we, we know that some of these animals are able to range as much as 50 kilometers in a single day. Um, so they're not shy to, to, get, uh, to get active and get out there. So what do they eat? Well, again, the camera traps can be quite, quite useful. Um, they are hugely opportunistic uh, and will eat just about anything. Um, so if you look carefully in this picture, you'll see that uh, this leopard is uh, having a preparing for the evening meal with a little oars duvre. A little mouse, a moose. Um, so it shows you they'll eat anything from, from mice to rodents, little other rodents or lizards or uh, whatever they can get their, their, their grubby paws onto. Um, but their preferred diet is uh, slightly bigger. In this case, there's a, uh, a red rock rabbit at the top and a dussy, which is a preferred dietary species at the bottom. Uh, very unusual to get these on, on the camera traps. I believe there's been a recent sighting on a camera trap around the Manus area with a uh, leopard with an antelope in it. Again, very unusual and, and, and great value to us to find these pictures. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the scat analysis is uh, particularly important. And if we're able to, to find scats, which we do, we, we collect some of it, not all of it, because remember I said earlier that it forms an important part of the leopard's uh, marking its territory. So we don't remove the scat entirely, but just enough of it to be able to do the necessary research. And, and that's able to, to reveal all sorts of things. So through the analysis of the, of the hair, uh, cuticles and uh, bone in there, hooves, uh, pads, etc., we're able to identify what these animals are eating. And um, on the basis of those animals that have had the GPS collars, we're able to approach, uh, once they've left the area, approach where we believe they have kill sites because they remain in those areas for several days, particularly if they've caught a, a, an antelope, which they might hang around for several days eating it. And, and we can actually go to the exact place where the kill took place and analyze what uh, it remains behind. Um, the staff, uh, the team, and the, the Buenaf Mums assure me it's not as easy as it seems because that's the kind of terrain that they're having to, to dig through to find the remnants of a kill sometimes many weeks later. Uh, and, and very challenging. But often you do find them, uh, the, the uh, jawbone of an antelope, uh, in this case in the bottom right, obviously porcupine, and a red uh, rock rabbit at the top, right hand corner, uh, are all indicative of the typical prey species of, of these animals. So in, in the Bulland Mountain Complex, um, which is uh, sort of the area that we're focusing on at the moment, uh, the, the leopards uh, have chosen a fairly varied diet. Um, Approximately 20% uh, of, their, of their dietary biomass is coming from hyrax, rock, uh, from dussies. They do like clip springers when they can catch them. Uh, porcupines, of course, and uh, uh, facebook. Um, so these are typically the kind of things that they're predating on. But if we look at some of the other areas in the study areas in the Cedarburg, we notice that the dietary composition is somewhat different. Um, again, that could be a reflection of the of different environments in which they are, it's far more arid. Um, and in the little Karoo, we see for the first time the presence of baboon. Uh, we're often asked, do leopards catch baboons? And the answer is pretty much no. Um, baboons are, are scary things, and they, are, uh, they tend to be in packs, which makes it very difficult and threatening for a, a solit solitary smallish leopard to predate on, unless, of course, they're, they're injured. Um, but so we don't see that as a significant contribution in the diet, although there is an indication that in parts of the, uh, the little crew, there's an adaptive learned behavior or has been. And some of the research that Gareth Mann, Dr. Gareth Mann did there for his PhD, suggested that some of the leopards had developed a technique of reversing into very thorny bushes in ravines. They could sort of reverse in and be protected all around them by the thorny bushes, and then they would wait for the baboons to come past and sort of pick off the vulnerable one and reverse back into the bush, uh, knowing that they would be fairly well protected from, from the baboons uh, as, they, as they came uh, uh, rushing in protest. But that seems to be um, uh, an exception rather than the rule. So 
So what are the threats to leopard survival in the cape? This is all a very important question and it's something that citizen scientists can get involved in um, in some way. Uh, and we're going to speak about snaring in that regard. I mean, obviously there's the big ones, the agricultural and urban, urban development, so urban sprawl, agricultural sprawl is has uh, reduced habitats and, and fragmented it. I mentioned earlier, could leopards be passing through from the Kocherberg to the Hermanus Mountains? Well, they've got to get across a busy road, and that's a, that's a huge problem. And they've got to get across farmland and fences, etc. So, you know, that's a perennial problem. I mean, fire in the Fambos biome is, is natural. We know that it's an important part of Fambos ecology, but often the fires are too frequent or too large, or, uh, you know, that contributes to... Um, to the, to the loss of prey species uh, sometimes for significant periods of time. And because the leopards can't move out of the area so easily, then they're, they're left uh, without sufficient prey. Poisoning, uh, not specifically rodent poisoning in this case, that's more applicable to the, um, to the caracal on the peninsula, but uh, poisoning in the food chain is, is a problem and deliberate poisoning, of course. And um, I mean, direct persecution from farmers isn't a major issue in the, in the Boiland area, but it was in areas of uh, the Northern Cape and originally in the peripheries of the Cedarburg, although not any longer, uh, I'm pleased to say. Um, but the big problem at the moment is illegal, illegal hunting uh, uh, through snaring uh, for, for bush news. And particularly even in this time of COVID, we've seen a huge increase in that, not just in the Western Cape, but nationally as well. And I'm going to touch on that shortly. So, you know, it's this perennial problem where, where people meet wildlife. You have this interface, which is often uneasy. Um, the picture of the Franchic Valley. And it's one of the areas in which we've seen a, a huge increase in, in wire snaring. It's indiscriminate. It's barely visible. It's, um, it's pervasive. Uh, and uh, it's hugely damaging because it's, uh, it's non-selective. And it's a horrible way for any animal to get into a snare. So not only is this a threat to leopards in general, but particularly to, to the prey species. Um, yeah, so it's easy to establish these with bits of string and wire that's left around. And, and it really is a, is a huge problem. So if you're out walking in the mountains anywhere, cast your eyes along the fence lines. Uh, it could even be next to the golf course or wherever you're walking on a farmer's boundary and keep looking for these wire snares. That you'll, you'll see them very easily and it's easy to, for you to remove them. Carry a pair of pliers with you. Um, but you know that's typically the outcome we see, and, and the tragedy here is that these animals <coughs> uh, often are just abandoned, and the traps are set, and then they're not visited very often. So the meat is in fact spoiled; it's not even used for bush meat, um, and it, it really is a, a, a scourge that we're, we're having to face. Uh, the extent to which the Cape Pepper Trust has really made it a focal area of, of its uh, conservation efforts. And um, we, we now have a, a dedicated team, a snare patrol, uh, we're working with landowners also to take responsibility, particularly those landowners that, that own farming property adjacent to, um, you know, wilderness areas to, to be responsible uh, and to work with us in this program. And I'm pleased to say we've had some tremendous results, but, you know, it's also tragic to see what's captured in these snares uh, a significant proportion of small antelope and, and porcupine, which are, are of course prey species for leopards. So, you know, by removing them from the system, uh, we're putting leopards under pressure, and the consequence of that is that they'll look for their dietary supplementation elsewhere. They wouldn't normally choose to to predate on uh, livestock; it forms very little uh, of their of their dietary component. Um, but but this is not going to help that situation at all. So, you know, again, just uh, reflecting on, on snare removal and data collection. Um, so again, as a citizen scientist, you, you could be out there helping us uh, to remove these and reporting them. So we've got an app now that you can actually uh, download. If you see anything, you can take a picture or report a location and we'll send a team out to, to try and address it. Um, the photograph on the bottom here with all the little yellow dots or, or orange dots indicates just one farmer's property or one farm. In our, in our study area where uh, there were traps or snares. There. So uh, there were at least 20 snares on that property along in the boundary fence between the agricultural land and the mountain land. So it really, it really is a scourge. So, you know, in the past year, we've conducted uh, 218 patrols in the, in the Boiland Mountains, uh, randomly all over the place, um, patrolled more than 1,500 kilometers on foot in remote areas, removed 673 traps. Um, and so this is important work. But it's, it's more than that. I mean, we have to get, it's not something that can just be the responsibility of the Cape Leopard Trust. 
and a couple of individual researchers. This now has to be a collective issue. And so we're addressing the problem with landowners, with authorities, with the management authorities, in this case, Cape Nature and others, uh, through education programs and outreach. And uh, it's been wonderful and gratifying to see how uh, many of the landowners and the farmers are taking responsibility for addressing the problem themselves, which is really, really good to hear. Uh, so see, these are some of the snare workshops conducted on, on farms in the region. Uh, and it's, I, I think it's really important uh, to mention that many of these farmers take great pride in, in their, their product and, uh, and they wouldn't want to be um, thought to be part of the problem and, and they're therefore willing to be part of the solution, and particularly those that have properties that are butt up against um, the mountain land. Other challenges, of course, are things like feral dogs, and, and uh, this is also a problem, particularly in the Franchuk area. These are wild packs of dogs that have gone completely feral uh, and, uh, and hunt uh, uh, wild animals, uh, again, a threat to leopards. Um, and, and often, and, and very interestingly, uh, they are the ones that are responsible for livestock uh, mortalities, and then leopards are, are quickly blamed, or caracal, or jackal. Uh, when in fact, in many cases, it, uh, it is in fact very dogs. Road mortalities. So, you know, please drive slowly at night over remote mountain passes. This is a tragic incident, I think, on Bainsburg. And then, so direct persecution, which I mentioned earlier, which is where, you know, a, a, an animal, leopard, perhaps a young, dispersive male, a little bit unsettled about his new territory. Uh, gets into um, a crowd of sheep that is uh, not well protected and, and is confronted with a situation where animals don't run away. And that can cause a lot of damage. They can kill many animals in a, in a, single, in a single go, simply because they're not conditioned to an animal standing around bleating at it. Um, their prey runs away very fast, so they're confused. And so you get a situation where a leopard might kill 10 animals in an evening and a farmer will be justifiably hugely upset. So, you know, how do we deal with these issues when they do happen? Um, and, um, well, I, I mean, when they do happen, it, it's not very often, but it does occur, particularly in areas where stock farming is the, is the primary agricultural purpose. Uh, and there are a number of ways in which we address it. I think this slide speaks more to the fact that uh, in the Bullamp, that's not a problem at all, and, uh, and very less so in the Cedarburg, although it does occur in areas where there are subsistence farmers, and for them, losing a single head of sheep is, is a major problem. So uh, our, our scientific offices in that area are uh, working closely with those communities to seek ways in which we can solve that problem without, uh, without consequences for the leopards. And there are many, many uh, strategies in place. Um, livestock guarding is the obvious one. You know, put the human in the loop. Uh, empowering human herders to do what they've done for thousands of years, protecting their livestock rather than just crawling them and hoping for the best. Um, but interventions like Anatolian shepherd dogs, uh, even donkeys and alpacas have been hugely, hugely helpful. In Cedarburg, particularly the Anatolian dogs have, been, uh, have shown us that they are uh, massively important in, in solving this problem. But there are other things too, like electronic scarpwachter deterrence with flashing lights and things that put the leopards off. Uh, and, um, and, and sent to deter predators. So there's a whole basket of, of things that you can apply and they are very effective. It's just a matter of, of getting them out there and, and implementing. So the, uh, the Bullan project that I've been speaking about extensively is now in its 10th year. And uh, it's, uh, it's an extensive area uh, run by a very dedicated team in quite uh, demanding conditions. And, and I know many of our supporters have uh, pledged cameras and have sponsored cameras and go and service them themselves. And we're very grateful for that, so hint, hint. Those of you that are fit and feel inclined to work with us in, in that regard. Um, uh, the Boiland Mountains, uh, this particular project, as I mentioned before, runs in this north south axis, basically from Cape Huncliffe and the Kroffelberg uh, up to uh, the Tilbach area. Uh, it's a higher resolution map, it's a, it's a vast area, but we've got a huge amount of data on the leopards from, from this particular area uh, based on, on 10 years worth of, of data collection. And we feel we've really got a, a good grip on them. So um, there's that boundary near, near Clay Montagain, and it's safe to assume that there will be some uh, transitioning of, of animals uh, safely, we hope, across that divide so that the populations aren't entirely isolated. As we mentioned earlier, these animals are able to cover vast distances and are not scared to come into the peri urban areas or agricultural areas. 
Um, so just to, just as we get towards the end of the presentation, just to share with you some of the other interesting data we collect from these camera traps, uh, particularly from the Boilant area. Um, this is always entertaining to show you that, um, that they're not the only animals. Of course, the leopards are, are, are few and far between compared to these little guys. And they tend to have a lot of fun with our camera traps, very curious. So we get lots and lots and lots of pictures of baboons, uh, almost as if they're taunting us. But then there's a whole bunch of, of, of mammals, and um, I'm sure many of you will know what they are. But uh, for those of you that don't, it's a clipspringer. That's a favorite uh, a prey species of, of the leopard. Uh, there's a great prey spork. Uh, there's a common dacre. There's a great rebork. Porcupine. The, the leopards are, are very adept at flipping these guys over safely so that they can get to them without being impaled by the quills. It's a favorite prey stock stuff. It's a hare. It's a red rock rabbit. Um, probably not a preferred prey species for leopards, but always great to see these guys. That's a honey badger. Um, at the top, we've got uh, a large spotted genet, and the bottom, with a little mouth, a mouse in his mouth, is the small spotted genet. Uh, on the left is a small uh, grey mongoose, and on the right, the large variant of that. That's a water mongoose. Uh, it's a Cape Claudus otter. Uh, that is a striped polecat, and this is a very interesting, very tiny little, in fact it's the smallest carnivore, I think, on the African continent. It is an African striped weasel, it's actually diminutive, it's only a few, about 10 or 15 centimeters long, so it looks a bit bigger, maybe it's a bit bigger than that, but it, it, it looks a bit bigger than it actually is in this picture. Um, and, and what's fascinating about this, there is caught a little thing, um, is that until this camera survey was done in the, in the Boilant Mountains, its distribution was not thought to be so far west. So, you know, some great science is coming out of just these, these camera trap surveys that we're doing. That's Cape Fox, Fatty-Ed Fox, that you all know is Aardvark, uh, African Wildcat, with a kitten, that's our friend the caracal. So I'm really arch enemies with the leopards. So they, they compete with each other. So they, they try and avoid each other where they can. Um, there's no question that they'll go into battle if, if a leopard comes across a, um, a caracal. And so they tend to use the environment somewhat differently. And then, of course, the, the leopards. Now, these are the guys that we, we, we all want to see uh, and very seldom do. But uh, in this case, we've got some daytime pictures, which is quite unusual. That's Bacardi. Again, we did, they normally have scientific numbers, but the, the teams have given these nicknames. The substantial male. Another guy, big guy, Diego. It's Rose. She's casually walking along the catwalk somewhere in the Kochelberg. Shiloh. Nala up in Statainscliff. That's on the, on the Worcester Rossenville side of the mountains. Gabulani. Pretty up in the Toys Cliff. Enzo hangs out in the Bemershoop area near Montrachel, for those of you that uh, go walking in the snow. Sky is up in the Hottentots Holland Mountains, and she's not scared of the cold either. So, some really great pictures here. Neo Helsworth area. Scott from the Spiembras area. And those are just a few of the leopards that we know occur in the Boulant area. And I just want to sort of get to the concluding slides of this presentation before I field some questions. Um, the, the, the Cedarburg project, of course, is, um, was established first up in the Cedarburg. And that's an ongoing uh, project. Uh, Katie Williamson, uh, a principal researcher up there, is uh, embarking on some really, really exciting work in, in that area. And um, the extension work we're doing at the moment as well is also extending to the, the Picketburg area, um, which is more on the sort of Strunkfeld side of the world, where there's some proper issues which they're having to deal with in terms of uh, uh, human wildlife conflicts. So, uh, yeah, it's quite challenging, but we're making good progress there. And then the Environmental Education Project, which I haven't spoken about. All of this uh, detail is, is on the website. So I'd encourage any of you that have an interest in, in the broader work that we're doing to visit that website um, and to see what the education project does, because it's uh, really important that we get the message about uh, environmental conservation out using the leopard as the apex species to hang, uh, to, to have that, you know, that's the sort of the peg upon which we hang this work. And uh, it's very well received. So what can you do to help us? Please follow us on our website. Uh, we're on all the social media. Uh, I'll put those up for you 
shortly to have a look at. Uh, please, please spread awareness of the work that we do and the importance of protecting leopards because of their, their consequential uh, impact on the rest of their, their habitat and everything else in it. Um, if you know any farmers, get them to speak to us if they've got a problem with their animal husbandry. And if you know anyone with land, or if you own land or you walk in the mountains, please be on the lookout for snares. That's the, the, the big issue at the moment. Um, and it's something that you can easily do. Um, so be snare aware. It's uh, obviously a very important message. Um, you know, one of the things you can do there as well is to help with the removal of, of this discarded wire. There's so much wire lying around discarded, and it just forms, you know, it's just so easy for people to, to use it for snaring. If we remove that, uh, then we remove some of the problem. Um, yeah, I think I've spoken generally about, uh, about what you can do. I've mentioned the app, the online snare reporting tool, which you can download off uh, capeleopard.org.za, where you can report the uh, any wire snares that you see if you're less inclined to remove them yourself. And if you would like to involve uh, yourself in supporting us financially, there are very easy ways to do that that are, that are not painful at all. The My School, My Planet card, which many of you will be familiar with if you shop at any of those stores at the bottom. Uh, will contribute a portion of your spend back to beneficiaries. If you name the Capital Leopard Trust as a beneficiary, every time you spend money, uh, that organization will donate money on your behalf. And, and it's a lovely annuity income stream to support the work that we do. Uh, please visit our website. It's extensive. It deals with many, many more issues than I've spoken about tonight. It's a, a, a veritable uh, pot of information for you, and I uh, would encourage you to go and have a look at it. Um, if it's Christmas time coming up, we've just launched a really fabulous book um, called Footprints in the Fame Boss. Uh, we went to the launch uh, a week or two ago. It's really been well received. It's an educational book for kids, and uh, please buy one from us. It's in Afrikaans as well, Footsquare in the Fame Boss. And it would be remiss of me not to mention the support we've had from uh, our many supporters over a long period of time. And it, it's worth mentioning that just about all of these supporters have been with the Cape Leopard Trust for the full 15 years, uh, which would indicate that they are pleased with the, the work that has been done and the results that have been achieved. And we're enormously grateful to all of these organizations for, for the enduring support of what we believe is a, a very important conservation issue. Those are our handles, please follow us. And it remains for me only to say thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. And I hope you benefit from this, uh, this chat tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. I'm going to try to get through some of the questions. Um, maybe I'll just start by, by asking you, a lot of us were quite amazed by that story of the leopard out here um, near Betty's Bay that started snacking on our penguins. And maybe you can just tell us a little bit about that story if, if you are familiar with it. Uh, thanks, Michael. Yeah, I knew that one was going to come up. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, what a, what a wonderful story, really. I mean, uh, of course, it divided the leopard supporters and the penguin supporters, but it really was a classical example of opportunism. Um, uh, you know, as an ecologist, I, I have sympathy for both sides, but it, it is worth bearing in mind that African penguins never, ever colonized the coastline of, of South Africa until humans came into the mix because historically there were always predators. There were hyenas, there were leopards, there were caracal, there were jackals. There was every manner of predator that was you know, going along the beaches and they would have had no chance to, to, to breed on the coastline. So they were all island based until we came along and created an opportunity for them. So the Boulders Beach Penguin Colony and the Stony Point Beach Colony is as a consequence of us creating houses as a buffer between the mountains and the penguins. And, and therefore, they've had relative safety. And for the protection of people, they've, they've had extra safety. But it was this opportunistic young female leopard that managed to cross the road, sneak through several properties around someone's swimming pool, down to the colony, and grab a penguin and trot off back into the hills that captured everyone's imagination. It was, it was actually fantastic to see. I, mean, I, I, I don't think we can, we can blame her for, for being opportunistic. And of course, it upset the penguin people. Andrew, um, um, one of the questions coming through from Gert is, do you have an estimation on numbers or do we not really talk about numbers of leopards? And has it increased or decreased um, since you've been doing this work? Yeah, yeah. thanks Gert. Thanks very much for the question. And, and it's a great question. It's one we always ask and it's always one that's difficult to answer. So I'm going to try and give you the best answer I can. Um, in the broader Western Cape, 
uh, we believe there are many hundreds of leopards. Uh, there are hundreds, but I can't put a precise figure on it. Um, I, it could probably be a little bit more accurate in the Bullan project. Uh, but I think what's most important is to understand that the, the population appears now to be relatively stable. And certainly our experience in the Cedarburg over 15 years would suggest there's far less churn than there was before. So what was typically happening at the outset of the work that we were doing there is there was quite a lot of mortalities uh, in, this, in the greater Cedarburg area pre-2004. You know, they're losing seven or eight leopard a year in, in other gin traps or some form of, of, um, uh, of consequence. And, and those leopards, every time a, a, a large male leopard gets removed out of the system, it creates opportunities for dispersing males and it confuses the balance of the, of the population dynamics. And uh, but once the population becomes stable and you get dominant males in place, uh, there's, there's much less of, of that kind of thing happening. And, 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 and certainly through the interventions of the uh, engagements with farmers around stock management, um, those issues of, uh, around you know, leopards being killed in the area have completely stopped. So the, the, the leopard population is now supported by the ecology of the, of the wilderness area and is relatively stable. So we're not necessarily thinking that they're increasing or declining. Uh, but there is uh, they're, they're stable. That's great to hear. Pat was asking, I think you've already answered this, but would you assume that baboons are more afraid of elephant, uh, leopards, not elephants, or are leopards more afraid of, of baboons? And she asked whether they might prey on the solitary or a vulnerable uh, baboon as opposed to um, going, going into a troop of baboons. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, baboons, as anyone who knows that has walked in the mountains or been confronted by a baboon, perhaps uh, those that have been habituated, well, no, they're very scary. Uh, they've got huge fangs and uh, they're, 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 they're nasty and they work in packs. So, you know, a solitary leopard, uh, particularly a, a female leopard that weighs only 20 kilograms, is no match for a, for a male uh, baboon and certainly not a pack of them. So she's never going to try her luck. Um, but uh, Pat's quite right. If there was a, an incident where there was a, a baboon that is uh, severely injured, you know, they sometimes do fall off cliffs in the rock fall or, or, or they get maimed. I mean, many of the baboons in the Western Cape have been caught in gin traps and have lost limbs and um, are in a bad way. And, and if they were to be vulnerable and she would to be, have the opportunity to pick one off, she, she might try that or he might try that. But the real threat is that the rest of the baboon troop then come at her or him and, uh, and and they would be very scared of that so they they as i described the the sequence of events in the little crew where they can ambush um that would that would sort of be the way in which it would happen but otherwise it's not a preferred place to be. andrew some of us watched that documentary to skin a cat and it was a fascinating story about um you know swapping out real leopard fur for fake fur and the Shembe communities, um, how they used to use leopard for their traditional uh, attire. Um, have you, I know that wasn't one of the threats that you mentioned, but have, have you seen that as a positive um, effect and maybe explain more to people who don't know about it? Yeah, Mike, yeah, that's, a, that's a great example of where you know, um, conservation ingenuity has come in to solve a particular problem. So, you know, traditionally in, in uh, Isizulu culture, um, for traditional leaders, wearing uh, you know leopard headdress and leopard regalia is is part of uh, their, their history. And um, but you know, with time, as there are fewer and fewer leopards, you know, it's it's, it's a, it presents a problem because every time you know someone needs some new regalia, it means a leopard has to die, and that's that's not a great thing at all. So that has been a problem in, in KZN. And one of, the, one of the ways in which that was addressed was an NGO that came up with this fantastic idea to make faux leopard skin. Uh, and they did it so incredibly well. And it had all sorts of other benefits as well. You could throw it in the washing machine and you, know, you get it in different sizes and uh, you could bling it or, or whatever the case is. So you know, it, it presented a wonderful alternative to the, to the natural variation. And, and you know, obviously, the hard work was not in, in producing the, the faux leopard skin, but in rather convincing the community that this was a, an important necessary step for them without losing uh, what was an important, in their minds, cultural um, aspect of, of, of what it meant to be Zulu. So, yeah, so that, that, that's a great step. It doesn't appear to be a problem in the Western Cape that the, the leopards are being poached for, for their pelts, but, I mean, you know, it, it, could, it could become a problem in the future. So we, we, we like that. We like that strategy. 
And I think it's quite similar to those ideas you're talking about. Um, I, I know for a while they, you, you could buy predator friendly meat in the stores and this idea that if a farmer looks after his livestock, um, there would be a premium for that sheep meat or whatever it was because you knew no leopard or caracal was injured in, 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 in that farming practice. Uh, do you think that's something that might also, um, um, you know? Yeah, they, I mean, they, these, are, these are great initiatives and it's always wonderful to see them coming about. I mean, I think I, if I reflect on my own experience in, uh, in the Cedarburg, when, uh, and, and, and I'm not sure if any of my colleagues from the Cedarburg are listening on this conversation, so I hope they forgive me, but when the Cape Labour Trust first attempted to start doing its research work in that area, it was not, it was not met with warm a warm embrace you know we, we were told to go and and we were told you know every time a sheep was eat, eaten they would come to us and say uh, you know your your tiger ate my sheep like it was our problem um but you know what with time we what's happened is that everyone's realized what an enormous benefit these, le these leopards our leopards everybody's leopards have uh for for the economy of that area. And whereas they were, you know, they were never thought of having any sort of commercial value, they're now a, an important part of the ecotourism to the region. And, and all of those farmers are now, you know, espousing the, the, the work of the Cape Leopard Trust and talking about the work. And there's this, this pervasive sense that if you're a visitor to the area that you might get a glimpse of an elusive leopard. It doesn't happen very often, but when it does, boy, boy, everyone hears about it. And it's very exciting. So. You know, I think there are ways in which you, know, you, you can turn the story around and make it uh, to get a completely different outcome. Andrew, Nina's got two questions. Um, so if you can remember the both, uh, she's fascinated. How does an alpaca uh, keep, uh, keep, keep the leopards away from the sheep? That's question number one. And question number two, she wanted to know, have any leopards actually been caught in the snares? Um, and are snares increasing or decreasing in abundance? Um, yeah, those are two questions. Right, thanks, Anina. Uh, um, I'm not entirely sure how alpacas are a deterrent. So I would imagine that in, in, in similar ways that uh, an Anatolian shepherd dog is. So it's just the mere presence of the dog with the sheep that is unusual uh, for, uh, for the leopards. They, uh, they have foreign scent. And the other thing that the leopard does, and which could be a common commonality with the alpaca, is that the, the sheep range out into the felt every day. But just like Pavlov's dog, at around five o'clock or six o'clock, the dog is hungry and wants to come home. And it turns around and heads for the vat, and all the sheep follow it. So, you know, it brings them back to crawl them safely around the homestead. And it, it could well be that the alpaca has a similar habit. But it's often just this foreign object that is different to the sheep, that has a different smell, uh, that is enough of a deterrent to, 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 to solve the problem. And, and then the second problem, snaring. Snaring is definitely on the increase. It's a, it's a huge problem. Uh, we've seen it increasing over the years. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, I think you know, this year, particularly as a consequence of, of COVID and, and, and um, what is clearly an increase in attempts to harvest bushmeat, um, we're seeing a massive increase in, in this uh, indiscriminate snaring. And I do some work in the Eastern Cape in, in every particular area. It is just, it's just devastating. Uh, have leopards been caught in those wire snares? Yes, they have, uh, with devastating consequences. Um, I haven't shown those pictures tonight. I, I edited them out of the slide deck because I didn't think they were appropriate to show you, but they are horrific. So, um, unfortunately, yes. Thank you, Andrew. I think we've run, run out of time, but I just want to thank you for, for taking the time to chat to us, for inspiring us. I'm sure there'll be a lot of us who will take you up on uh, sponsoring a, a camera trap and hiking into the mountains, or maybe buying one of your children's books to support those of us who have kids. And uh, just really, really inspiring chat and just shows uh, like-minded people who come together can really make a huge difference. Um, so thank you for the work you're doing. We really appreciate it. And I urge everyone to support your work and to download that app and to help in, in any way we can. And uh, we'll stay in touch and, and keep up the good work. Thank you very much. Have a great evening. Thank you very much. And thank you to all the subscribers, listeners and viewers. Thanks, Andrew. Keep well. Thank you. Michael. Goodbye, everyone. See you on the 10th. Bye.